I can't even begin to tell you how many. I prayed for a lady one day that I told some of y'all about it. She actually had a neck brace on and they told her if she took it off, she'd die within two minutes. And she'd had it on her for 12 years. She worked in uh, a carpet factory in Dalton and a big forklift dropped a roll of carpet off and hit her in the back and it broke her vertebrae. It crushed them in the back of her head and so forth. And she had had, I think it was, five major operations, but they couldn't do anything for her. But I didn't know anything about that. I just was walking off the platform and I said, are you ready? She said, yes. <laughs> and I grabbed that lady's brace and I threw it. And when I threw it down, the power of God hit that woman and she hit the floor. And when she hit, actually it was under, in, under my tent, she hit the ground. I'll never forget that. I said, don't worry about it. Her friends was looking over the aisleways trying to see her. <clears throat> Didn't think too much about it at the time. <clears throat> but the devil did tell me, he said, you're going to jail over this. He said, she'll die. I said, shut up, devil. And I kept on ministering. <clears throat> And she laid there all during service. And then the lady got up at the end of the service. I was doing something else and she started screaming. I said, oh my God, here it goes. And then as it turned out, I thought that was a miracle. I, I wanted to tell people about it. I took a picture. I printed a magazine in those days and I put it in our magazine. I guess what I was trying to say was I did really good out in the field, but I come to Dayton, Ohio, and you know, I bought a television here, and after that television, my life went to hell. <laughs> That's sad. You wouldn't believe that unless you knew more about it and had studied it as much as I did. But in saying that, I want you to point your fingers here and let's pray. Go and pray over the service. Father, we thank you right now. We ask you, Father, to open every heart and every mind. And Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus. I give you praise. And God, I thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said? All right. I want to thank everybody for being here today. Let's see if I can get my timer here working. There we go. So glad to be here. We're not running buses or anything right now, so our crowds are kind of down, and I uh, don't mind that at all. I feel really comfortable. Turn to the book of Philippians. I want you to go there with me. <laughs> Sister Pack was telling me that some of the churches today don't have the Word of God in them, and you know, I am so thankful that we're not the only one that sees that. It's been so sad looking at people and how they have trashed this country. So I want to talk to you today about the New Testament agenda of what our Bible is all about. Now I'm going to bring it out to you today as best I can. And the reason I'm putting so much emphasis on this because they have no idea where we went. Satan has worked on this ever since the days of Jesus Christ. And what I'm going to say that he's worked on is what I'm showing you today. They say there's about 40 Baptist church main denominations today. I haven't counted them lately. I know some years back I counted them. There was 33 at the time or 35. But you look at all the other denominations and there's so many they're not able to be counted. Me and Michelle, we did a, a program and Melanie and Mark and woman sent me an email and she says, I see that you're in the revelations and she says, have you considered, she said, I assumed that Michelle was talking about Israel. Have you considered Rome? <laughs> I wrote her back and I said, ma'am, I'm really uh, thankful to God that you even emailed me. It's good to hear from somebody. And yes, I considered Rome 40 years ago or longer. I said, and the truth of the matter is, Rome has very little to do with our Bible. But the way they fixed it today, they make everything point to Rome. Everything that's going on. Oh, that's Rome. That's Rome. That's Rome. 
So, you know, I gave her a lot of scriptures and I helped her with that a little bit. Whether or not she accepts that, I don't know. But anyway, I'm going to tell you what Satan has worked on for these 2,000 years, and you're going to be able to see it today in a more excellent way. And I, per, I assume that when people find out how true this is, they will find out that they do not have enough time to accomplish what I'm about to tell you. Because it is time consuming, as a matter of fact, it will take your entire life. I want you to look at the book of Philippians in a different way, but before you do, I want you to mark down these two verses, Genesis 1.26. Matter of fact, I want to give you three verses. Genesis 1.26, Ephesians 4.24, Colossians 3.10. And if you wanted to, you could even write down Romans 15, 5. Now, the reason I give you these verses is because it will clearly show you what the agenda of God is. How many of y'all still believe that the agenda of, uh, of the Christian should be to become like Jesus? Amen? That's not going to happen totally till we see him in the air. Then we're going to be changed and we're going to be like him. But until then, the main agenda of our Bible starts in Genesis 1, I think it is 26, where he says, and I'll just read it to you so people can understand this. <clears throat> and the Lord said, and let us make man in our image after the likeness and let them have dominion, etc., Okay, that's a good scripture. We all like that scripture. But the real truth about it is the New Testament is the fulfillment of everything in the Old Testament. You look at Matthew 5, 17. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Everything is fulfilled in the Old Testament. Every prophecy, Jesus had fulfilled it. You can find that very easy. But today they have a group of preachers and a group of people across this country that are trying very hard to turn people's minds in the wrong direction. I wish I had a lot more time. I would take you even deeper into this. But the big thing they're not telling people is the agenda of our Bible has to do with scriptures such as Colossians 3.10, which talks about the new man. It also has to do with Ephesians 4.24, which is the new man. It also has to do with Romans 15.5, in a sense. I'll tell you where, uh, a little bit more about Romans 15.5, maybe in a little bit. But the whole idea is that if Christians learn the agenda of the wise man, they will get a hold of what I'm saying here. In other words, putting on the new man is not that easy. Many people might say they understand it, but paying attention to it, letting it become a part of your life is a very different situation. And I'm going to tell you today that we are standing in a time when they have fought this every way they can. The real idea of the New Testament is to be like Jesus. You find this in these scriptures like this. 2 Corinthians 2.16. You all know what that scripture is, right? Let me hear you say amen. amen. 2 Corinthians 2.16 talks about the mind of Christ. You put his mind on. When you want to fulfill Genesis 1.26, and if you love God, you will try to do this, you learn to put on his mind. What is putting on his mind? That's memorizing what was in his mind, his scriptures which he preached. And he talked about that in John 7 and John 8 when Jesus says, I only preach that which my Father taught me. And he told the Jews in John 8, he said, you do that which your Father taught you, I do that which my Father taught me. If you want to fulfill the Bible, and if you want to have God to be a greater part of your life, you have to learn to think like Him. So many people today cannot adjust, they cannot get uh, a place, I mean, their lives are torn up. So I'm gonna show you how this book of Philippians fits into that and how that Paul was so actually concerned about this church that he had founded. And this goes all the way back to the Philippians jailer, whenever, you know, that's kind of who he was writing to here, whenever they prayed at midnight and God come down and busted the jail open and let everybody in there out. 
So the whole idea is that we as Christians, we want to become like Jesus while we're here. Why do you want to do that? Because if you don't have scripture in your mind, you can't do what he done in Luke 4, 4. When he said, it is written, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And this, if you look at this word, W-O-R-D, you find it in the Strong's Bible Concordance as meaning rhema. What does that mean? That means the Holy Ghost was speaking to his heart and he spoke out of his mouth what the Holy Ghost said to him. Every Christian can do that. Every Christian can speak words by the Holy Ghost. He will help you how to fight. That entire idea is seen in Ephesians 6, 17 about the helmet of salvation. If you've got a Strong's, you can look up the word W-O-R-D and it's not Logos. It's 4487, which is Rhema. And that describes how the Holy Ghost deals with us. But the whole idea is here, many people today don't have the scriptures in them. You know, if you look in John's gospel, you find out that Jesus had the scriptures in him from a youth. So here's where we're going. I want you to notice these scriptures I gave you now to show you what the agenda is. It's to put on the new man. And that's what I could tell you in many scriptures that talks about that in the New Testament once you know what we're looking for. Now this is only accomplished by getting the minds and the words of the Lord Jesus in your heart. What they have did, we brought it out on our radio, radio program, how that they have actually created all of these fake books they call revised versions of Bibles. They created them for the idea to scatter you. And they had this in their mind 30, 40 years ago, but we didn't know what they were talking about. I was too busy to get into it. And the idea of it is, if they've got all of these different Bibles, 53 different versions, I think is what I've got in my last uh, account, how are you ever going to have the mind of Christ when none of them are the same? It's not possible. So the whole idea is that you look, and they've got so many ideas about some of the books they've got have taken verses all the way out of the Bible. They don't, even, uh, uh, they don't even point to what we're talking about. None of the preachers that claim to be so great with the hundreds of millions of dollars even mention this idea. I wonder why. Well, could it be because they want to sell you something? One of their books? How come they don't ever tell you what the Bible says? How come Joyce Myers always wants to tell you, well, just get my book? You know, God didn't allow selling in the temple. John chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, 16. If you look at it, he took a braided whip and he ran them out of the temple because they were selling things in the house of God. And Jesus said, it is written, my father's house is the house of prayer and you made it a den of thieves. And they've turned our country in now to a den of thieves. You can't even listen to a real gospel message that they're preaching today except they want to sell you something. You ever think that's strange? Every single one of them. And you know what? It goes all the way back. I could get into that more, but I won't do that right now. I want you to look at me in this book of Ephesians. I want you to go with me. It's a very powerful book. The word alone, mind, minded, mindful, and minds, M-I-N-D-S, they're mentioned in this book several times. This is the book about the mind. And I'm going to show you that today. I'm going to show you how this applies. If you look in verse 27, Philippians 1:27, you'll find out how that this church, and I look at this in a different kind of way than I used to look at this book, because the book in 127, in the book of Philippians, he brings this out so that you can see how people's life go up and down. How they never get established. They go from one thing to the next thing. They're up and down, in and out. But he has the word here in verse 27. One of them is stand fast. That's very important. He tells them how that they may stand fast and how this church can prevent a split. Many churches, they are split because they have so many different beliefs. And you look at today, you find that the Bible Institutes, this is what we're fighting. They're turning out preachers today. I don't care if it's Moody Bible Institute, Dallas Theological Seminary, Liberty University. They are turning out people today that's using revised versions, which is not having anything to do with our Bible. The whole purpose is it for you to turn you around. 
I think everybody should learn this. Everybody should get it in your heart to turn you around. They want you mixed up. They don't want you to put on the mind of Christ. If you notice something in 1 first, in, uh, first Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6, he talks about the one that's perfect. He don't really mean perfect like what most people think perfect. He's talking about mentally and morally developed as a Christian. And then he says in those, I speak to the wise among you in chapter 2, verse 16. So the wise people know what I'm talking about that have spent a lot of time in prayer. Can you learn without a lot of time in prayer? No, sir. I'll be the first one to tell you. If you do, you'll be, as my mama used to say when I was a boy, don't worry about them, son. They're educated idiots. That's about what you become without the Word of God because they living in a world have no idea that people are going to hell right and left. But there's a lot of fools that the Bible talks about too, but I won't get into that. In verse 27 of Philippians chapter 1, if you notice what he said, let your conversations be as it becometh the gospel of the Lord Jesus. The conversation is talking about citizens of heaven. You know what we talk about. I don't care anything about a football game, do you? I don't care anything about soccer. I don't care anything about night news. I don't even believe in it. I believe it's all fake. I believe it's all made up in some place in New York. I don't believe in the night news. I believe it is a total scam. And I believe that they use those things to create propaganda in the eyes of the people that don't know any better. They listen to it, but I seen last night they passed a law now where they have actually got $700 million, which is just a drop in the bucket to them, that they have given to this country allows them to legally feed our country with propaganda. Now some of the people have no idea what that means. But I can show you the article. I still got it downstairs. So we have an agenda. Verse 27. We want to talk about things of God. Amen. We want to talk about the Holy Ghost. I want to talk about the Bible. I want to talk about being filled with the Holy Ghost. I want to talk about getting somebody saved. Because pretty soon we'll be at the judgment seat of Christ. And we will have a reward only for what you have done that matters. Amen. Amen. Now he says. <laughs> this leads me to believe. <clears throat> verse 26 it talks about him uh, by his coming again unto you he's concerned about what they had been taught because apparently they're suffering what we are suffering how many of y'all know the devil never changes he's doing the same thing today that he did 2,000 years ago the Bible doesn't change the devil don't change the world don't change the Holy Ghost don't change amen, amen. these are things you have to learn People want to look back, well, that was back, back then. Shut up. So look what it says. I may hear of your affairs. He said that you stand fast, verse 27, one spirit and one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. You can't strive together for the faith of the gospel without having one mind. How does that one mind happen? You put on the word of God. You fill yourself with it. And you'll find out if you don't have the one mind, you're not going to be in one spirit. This is kind of where this book starts at. And this is a very powerful book. You find out this word stand fast means that you're not up and down, that you're more grounded in the Bible. And that's what people have to learn. They learn how to stand fast and why their life goes in a circle sometimes don't really go anywhere. If you look here, <clears throat> he says in verse 28, apparently they have opposition in that church, and I'm sure if you serve God, you're going to have opposition wherever you're at. But it says, <clears throat> nothing be terrified by your adversary, which is to them an evident token of perdition, and to you of salvation. But it's given, on, given unto you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also suffer for him. Just the little stuff that I've said now, if you believe what I told you, and you set your life and you put your life in a direction, say, you know what, I think I'm going to start memorizing scripture every day. I don't think I'm going to let a day goes by that I don't get my pencil down and write me some scripture and take it to work with me or, you know, take it with me and try to learn these and get them in my mind. If you make that, you're going to have some people say, oh, blah, 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 blah. You know, they're not going to do that because you know what, they don't know what I know. 
And do you know what? They don't really know what the Bible says. And do you know what? Many of them will fall by the wayside and their life will go up and down. That's what the Bible teaches. But anyway, you'll find out that you have to suffer for his name's sake. How many of y'all know that you're not greater than Jesus? If Jesus suffered, you've got to suffer. If they come against him, they're going to come against you or else you are not like him. Now, you'll fall in there somewhere. If you're like him, the more you're like him, look what they did to him. I mean, the more you become like Jesus, the more you're going to have problems in this world with people, friends, family. Kind of gets cut down. I got down to one sister, you know, that loved me. <laughs> I had another one wouldn't talk to me. I didn't have any friends. I remember the last friend I had, I called him up when I got saved, and I told him, you know, man, I said, you remember Joe. You remember Joe? <laughs> little guy. This little brother here was in the jails with me back in the 70s. But anyway, to make a long story short, I told Joe, I said, Joe, I just found out God is real. And he said, oh, what are you doing, man? He said, what are you taking, pills or something? You know, but nevertheless, people don't really understand. Let's look. I want to talk to you now about suffering a little bit. I don't want to get too much into it because it's not where the totality of my message is. But I want you to understand this book. I'm going to try to get through as much of the four chapters as I can. In chapter 2, he talks about basically becoming who you are. One of the things about chapter 2 that they will not talk about very much, and it all goes to the idea of what your agenda is and what your goal is. <clears throat> chapter 2 is a very powerful book, very powerful chapter. But he's still concerned about this church splitting up and not having the right mind. Look what he said in verse 1. If there be any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit... Any bowels, any mercies, there's five things. If you're going to have anything like this in your life, if you're going to be a Christian with joy, with peace, that has some consolation, some, you know, satisfied yourself with working for God, he says, look in verse 2, fulfill you my joy that you might be like-minded. Here we go again. See, this has the ideal of the, uh, this being the basic foundation of your joy and who you are. If you don't have the mind of Christ, I'm sorry, you're not going that fast. You may, I mean, they don't talk about this and the agenda is not out there and people have no idea what it is and you would probably have a lot of people have to think about this and hear a message like this two or three times to get it into them. You want to make Paul happy? He said, if you're going to have any kind of love, he said, look, I mean, you could be separated. If you look at verse 27, you'll find out that's where they separate at. But that's not the only verse. I'll show you some more deeper into this book. So the whole idea that you really want to see, he says, the comfort of love. You can't even, verse 1, you can't even have the comfort of love if you don't get the mind of Christ. The devil will come to you with a bunch of junk and he will wind up at the end of the day causing you to be depressed, to think on the wrong things and, you know, to worry about this and worry about that. Well, if you had a good prayer life, it won't happen like that. But look what he said, verse 2. Fulfill you my joy that you might be like-minded, having the same love being of one accord and one mind. See, if you all got the scriptures inside of you, how many of y'all know that you have the same answers to problems? If you've got the Word of God down on the inside of you, you've got the same answers. You have the same questions and you'll make the same judgments. The same love, yes. If you know about the born again experience and you know about the blood covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ and what it takes to enter into a covenant with Him, they'll all have the same love. If you're in the churches today, they don't even talk about the blood covenant. You won't even learn what it is because why? They've never been taught and most of them today are either learning from TBN or those guys that come out of Dallas Theological Seminary, one of them guys, or they might have learned it from Fox News. Everybody today believes what they are on Fox. <clears throat> one of the pastors told me in Vienna, or told uh, Michelle here the other day, oh, I, I know I've seen it on Fox News. You know, that's the biggest piece of garbage I ever heard in my life. But anyway, look what he said. One accord, one mind, one spirit. This is all very important. And the whole idea is based upon what you put in your mind. Now, the Bible said in Romans 12, too. How many of y'all know that scripture? 
You should learn that Romans 12 too, because if you don't know that scripture, you won't understand this. Romans 12 too, that we're transformed through the renewing of our mind. If you don't have your mind renewed with scripture, you're not going to be transformed. You're going to be stuck out on an island somewhere. And you know, you just won't really get it. But if you had your mind transformed with scripture, that's what it's all about. That's why I said renewing your mind. In Ephesians 4.23, it said renewing your mind with the spirit. In 4.24, it tells you about the new man. If you look at this carefully, in Colossians 3.10, it talks about being renewed in the knowledge after him that created you. So you get the knowledge of God that created you, you get that in your mind, and then you're on your way. So anyway, in verse 5 of Philippians chapter 2, he gives you an example here in chapter 2. First of all, of the direction of your life, what it should be. What it should be in the direction that you have been going, where you're going. It tells you that a little picture of here of who you should be. And I'm going to show you how this is so different than what you see. Look in chapter 2, verse 5 of the book of Philippians. Let this man be in you. Here we go again. That was in Christ Jesus. That's the scriptures. Because that, it is, my, that is his man. And notice what it says. Who is in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, made himself to no reputation, took upon him the form of the servant, and was made in the likeness of a man. Now let me ask you a question. How different is this than John 7, 18? Look at John 7, 18. I want to show you something. Just give me a minute here. Open it up to John 7, 18. And, and you'll see what I'm talking about. In John 7, 18. I thought this was interesting. You can actually... Read 16, John 7, 16, 17, and 18. Look what it says. He says, Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Now this holds the ideal of you as a Christian and what your doctrine should be. Okay? If Jesus sent you, it's essential that you have his doctrine. So verse 17 says what? If any man will do his will... <clears throat> He shall know the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. So if you really serve God, you know what his doctrine is and you know what his will is. But look what he says in verse 18. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. Now, how many of y'all know these guys want to lift themselves up? Oh yes, I've got, I've got my jet airplane. and Oh yes, I, matter of fact, um, I'm Kenneth Copeland and I'm a billionaire and I've got several jet airplanes. Do you see the difference here? You cannot go against the Bible. You cannot have a preacher that speaks of himself and speaks of, uh, uh, of Jesus too. It don't work that way. You speak of Jesus. Everything us preachers preach, it has to be about Jesus. <clears throat> there can't be anything else. It don't fit into the Bible narrative or the Bible scheme. It just isn't there. So you have to preach the Word of God. Amen? That's what we call preaching the Word of God. I could show you other ones if you want to look at John uh, 16, what is it, 11, 12, and 13? You want to look at that one? I'll show you another one. Take a look. I don't want to let my time get away from me, but I think this is worthwhile because people need to learn to turn, their, turn those people off. Don't buy their trash books because their books aren't even real. <clears throat> chapter 16 verses 12 13 look what it says I have yet many things to say unto you but you cannot bear them now verse 13 how be it when he that is the spirit of truth is come 
He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he hears, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me. You see there? If you got a preacher that don't glorify Jesus Christ, get rid of him and cast him out. Find you somebody that's preaching Jesus out of our Bible and not out of a revised version that come from Hollywood. That's what I call them. I call them a Hollywood Jesus, Hollywood Bibles, because that's the group that created them. Anyway, I hope you understand what I said. I think it's very important. So back to Philippians chapter 2. So you find out if you really want to follow the footsteps of Jesus. How many of y'all know 1 Peter 2.21? Huh? I'll wait till you turn there. 1 Peter 2.21. Now if you want to be a Christian and you really want to have eternal life, and if you really want to be a, a great person that is wealthy with true riches, I ain't talking about this fiat money that's cranked up out of paper. I'm talking about real wealth. 1 Peter 2, 21. You love Jesus, say amen. amen. So 1 Peter 2, 21. Who by him do believe in God. Let's see, wait a minute. I'm sorry, that's the wrong chapter. <laughs> 2, 21. For even as much as you are called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Now, you want to follow his steps, you can go back now with me to, first, uh, to the second chapter of the book of Philippians. If you follow the steps of Jesus, you can see his steps here in chapter 2, beginning with verse 5, and you shouldn't have any problem. I mean, this is pretty obvious here. It ain't like I'm preaching a mystery. I, I haven't got into that. It's already here and. We've preached it many times, all the mystery of the New Testament with Christ and the Gentiles. But if you notice something, it says it gives you the agenda that every Christian should have in his heart, and that's to be like Jesus. But you have to work on it today while you're in this world. Yes, you get changed in the air, but you've got to have this idea. Being in the form of God, he didn't have... Uh, he thought it not robber to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant. Now, if you look up the word grace, and if you look it up in the Hebrew, you'll find out that it's in Strong's Bible Concordance, and it means that you find somebody when they're stooping down to pray for people that they don't have to. When they're stooping down to help somebody that they don't have to help. When they're humbling their self all the time. How many of y'all understand the ideal of being meek and lowly? You find that in Matthew 11, 29, 30. Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I will give you rest. You shall find rest unto your soul, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. For I am meek and lowly. Meek and lowly is a little person. Jesus come riding in on an ass. Boy, the Jews didn't like that. And if today you talk about Jesus riding in on an ass, they would never mention Matthew 21. They want to, he coming in on a, a royal jet airplane which is such a ridiculous lie. They've taken Jesus out of our Bible right in front of the American public and people won't even speak up about it. They've taken Jesus out of our, out of our Bible and replaced him with a pseudo-Jesus. They got him and he's a God that gives you big money. He don't give you faith anymore. I wonder what Peter would have did in, in 1 Peter, or excuse me, in the book of Acts, in chapter 3. When he said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. If he didn't have faith, he'd be hurting. But he said, such as I have give I unto thee. Honey, God can give you faith, and he does, by the power of the Holy Ghost that will cause you to not only be able to work miracles, but to live a miraculous life, to trade up on serpents and scorpions, and there's no devil, no demon, no lies can get by you. Can I hear an amen? This is what we're living in today. We're under attack and the church world don't even know it. They have no idea that they've stolen the scheme out of our Bible and replaced it with another scheme because the people don't even read the Bible. Many preachers today, they don't even open the Bible when they're preaching. And when they do, they don't even talk about born again. They don't talk about covenant. They don't talk about any of this. Nevertheless, if you look 
you find out that the idea of Jesus in 1 Peter 2, 21 is seen clearly right here in verse 6, in verse 7, verse 8. It talks about being found fashion of a man. First, let me finish with 7. Jesus was made of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. Now, I like this idea because you find that in many places in the New Testament. You find it in Jesus. In, in John 13, when Jesus was washing the disciples' feet, he said, Peter said, Oh, no, Lord, not my feet only. But Jesus said, Except I do this, you have no part of me. And he goes on down, and he says this in a couple of verses down. He said, if you do this, happy are you. He said, I didn't come except to be a servant. And we have to fashion ourselves. You want to do something for God, you've got to be a servant. Amen. There's no big great people in God. 1 Corinthians 1.26 tells you the whole story. He said, you know, my brethren, not many men are called after the great and the noble and the mighty man, and the rich man, all of these guys don't make it. For God chose the foolish things, the little people that will bow down humbly, receive the Holy Ghost, them kind of people. He fills them full of faith. He fills them, fills them full of scripture and he makes them to live a victorious life and to lay up much treasures in heaven. He became a servant. Verse number 8, Philippians chapter 2, he became a servant and was made in the likeness of a man. <clears throat> and being found as fashion of a man, he humbled himself. When you look at these people that don't humble themselves, I'm sorry, you lost them. They don't humble themselves and they don't talk about on their knees praying and giving their life to God. They're a bunch of hypocrites. It ain't going to happen. How many of y'all know that there's only one way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man coming to the Father but by me without walking in his word and staying in his spirit. I'm sorry, it won't work out. That's what it's all about. He became obedient to the Holy Spirit. And this has to do with this verse 8. It has to do with the blood covenant. Many people today, they've got them in churches. They don't even know what it means to be born again. They don't even want to mention it. Because you talk about this being obedient. When I got saved, I didn't know nothing about the covenant because of the churches I was in, they didn't know about it either. But the Holy Ghost pressured me, would I obey him? I said, well, I'll try. He said, ah. So I turned and I said, okay, I will. And when I did, the Lord touched me and sprinkled me with the royal blood and I become a royal person. And that's what it's all about. I had to be obedient to the Holy Spirit, obedient to the scriptures, and that's what it means here. Humbled himself and became obedient even unto death. I was bowing on my knees at an old-fashioned altar. That's how I got saved. And you know what? If you don't give your life to God, you cannot be saved. If you're not obedient, you can't be saved. If you don't humble yourself like Jesus, you cannot be saved. Amen. That's where we're at. But the good part about this is in chapter 2, you find out something that for all of those that will do this and give their life up willingly, look what it said in verse 9. Wherefore, for this reason, God highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, I like this, don't you? At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. I thought about that. They're under the earth and they're, they've waited a little bit long to care about the name of Jesus, but nevertheless, God had a purpose for talking about under the earth there. Because I know the devil liked to have his say so there, but God's got all power, amen? amen? Nevertheless, if you notice, this is very important, and I kind of brought this out a little bit. There's two places in Revelations that you talk about his name. And the third place, I think, is in the 22nd chapter when it talks about we shall see his face. I like that. But in chapter 2 in the book of Revelations, you find out that we're going to receive a white stone that no man knows save he that receiveth it. Amen? And on that white stone is a new name written. In other words, people aren't going to just be giving up everything here and just say, oh, I'm glad I escaped from hell. Shut up. 
I am a rich person. I'm royal. I've been washed by the blood of Jesus. Amen? Royal blood. 1 Peter 1.18. You know, I've been redeemed with such things as, as silver and gold. We've been redeemed by the royal blood of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2.9. A royal priesthood. That's who we are. We're royalty. We're the true royalty. Queen Elizabeth and all that crap ain't nothing. We're the real thing. Amen? I may not look like it, but it don't matter. I know I am because the white Bible says I am. But the whole idea is that we have been given authority to do what we do by the name of Jesus. He gave us that authority and no devil can take that. Now, I kind of like that. That's pretty good. In Revelations, if you want me to read it to you, I can. I know time is getting away from me. But in Revelations chapter 19, it said that Jesus is coming back and he's got names written. Amen? Amen? This is pretty good. You know, he's got the names. He comes back as the armies of heaven. And if you look at this real carefully in the 19th chapter of the book of Revelations, he's coming back, and he's coming back with his names. Many names. How many of y'all know that we're going to have some of those names too. He also had a name in verse 12, but that's not what I'm referring to. The, yeah, I think it is. He eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head was many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Now some people thought that referred to a different name than Jesus. No, the name of Jesus will never pass away. This word here, verse 12, talks about no man knew but he that receiveth it. It's that white stone that he talks about in chapter 2. We're going to have a new name written that no man knows. You don't know what your name is. I heard a preacher one time said, I asked Jesus what my name was going to be. <laughs> he said, but he never did answer me. I, I can see why. We're not supposed to know that in this world. Amen? Amen? But anyway, that ain't the only thing. We're going to have many crowns. If you look in 1 Timothy, you find crowns there. You find them in Thessalonians. We're going to have a crown of righteousness. That's an easy crown. All you've got to do is obey the Lord and be a good person and do what Jesus told you to do. That's what the crown of righteousness, righteousness is about. But there's some other crowns that we'll talk about maybe at a later date. Now, if you notice this in chapter 2 of Philippians... We can go on and get into chapter 3. I want to talk about this a little bit. I'm going to finish up there in chapter 2. I want you to look in chapter 3 of Philippians with me. And I'm not going to be able to spend as much time in this chapter as I want to, but I want you to look where this goes. Because the Apostle Paul, in the book of Galatians, he went up on a mountain in chapter 1 and stayed three years. He communed with no man. He said, I didn't commune with flesh and blood. He said, because flesh and blood didn't call me. He said, I actually spent three years up on a mountain by himself. He said, I didn't even go to Jerusalem. He said, I didn't go there. And then he talked about him going up there. I think it was for two weeks one time. But the whole idea is that if you look at Paul's high calling, you'll see what we're talking about. After he cautions them about playing with these guys that were, you know, that were not good people, we'll say it that way, in verses 1, verses 2, <clears throat> he goes in and tells them, in verses 3 and 4, in Philippians, look what he said, chapter 3, We are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus. We have no confidence in the flesh that I might also have confidence in the flesh. Though I might have had it, he said, if any other man thinketh that he hath or of, he might trust in the flesh. He said, I could have trusted more. He said, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was from the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrews of Hebrews, and as touching the law, he said, I was a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, he said, I persecuted the church. That made him a big man in the eyes of the Jews. They really liked him. 
And he said, as a touch in righteousness, which is of the law, he said, I was blameless. But notice what he said in verse number seven. Those things were gained to me, those I counted for loss, I did it for Christ. Verse eight, and doubtless I count all things for a loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I might win Christ. Now, you know, this is very amazing that what he done to gather all of this knowledge. Now, this is very important because you find out, I'll read it to you a little later on in this chapter. He tells you, once he found out about this knowledge, about putting on the mind of Christ and becoming a new man, he put it in high gear, buddy. He took off. He said, oh, you can have all this other stuff. He said, I, I don't want nothing to do with it. He said, I'm putting on this new man, he says, and I'm learning more every day. So he turns around and he casts all of these things out of his life. He said, I forgot about the Jew stuff. He said, I ain't a Jew no more. He said, I'm in Christ Jesus. He said, I don't care what they say. They want to lift me up. I don't care about that. You can have it all. You can have the money. You can have the wealth. You can have the world. He said, I count it all for a loss. For the excellency, look what he said, excellency of the knowledge of Christ. You want to get the perfect mind of Christ in you, the excellent knowledge? It's going to take some time, my brother. It ain't happening that fast. When you find out you don't have time to do it, I bet that'll get you in high gear if you really get a revelation of it. If you get a real revelation of this, you won't have no problem being in Bible study all the time. You'll be in prayer meetings. Problem is that many people don't understand this. <laughs> Paul, actually being an apostle, suffered many things. But yet when he ran into this idea about putting on the mind of Christ, that's what you call the excellency of the knowledge. Knowledge is what you know. Where do you get it from? First Peter, or excuse me, First Timothy 6, 3. The wholesome words of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is where you get it. So when you learn these things, you're on your way then. Look what he says. I'll take you on. I know my time is running up a little bit. Verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Now, you think Paul didn't suffer? He went all through the book of Acts. They beat him up. On one occasion, they left him for dead. And the apostles or the disciples, I know that, that followed him it was, they got around him and prayed. And actually, he came back to life. You know what I mean? They had really did a Paul a number. He tells you about that in 2 Corinthians 11 and 12. And he begged God to deliver him. And he said, you know what, Paul? My strength is made perfect in weakness. So anyway, to make a long story short, uh, it's very apparent that something is wrong. He says in verse 10, he said, being made conformable unto his death through suffering, <clears throat> and that's what it was all about. Now, a lot of people knock suffering, but if you look at Peter, his books were about suffering, especially 1 Peter. It's what that book is all about. In this book here, it's all about the mind. <clears throat> you find out in chapter 3, verse 10, God is still working on him. Verse 11, if by any means, he said, I might attain to the resurrection of the dead, not as though I'd already attained, Either were made perfect. Now look at this word perfect. 5046, and that's in verse number 12. And it means mentally and morally developed. If you look it up in Strong's Bible Concordance, it means mentally and morally developed. We have not put on the mind of Christ, but at this point Paul hadn't either, but he was searching it and he was seeking it. He knew about it. He knew what the agenda was. But I've learned as a preacher, you don't really preach things unless you've kind of experienced it. You can try to go on and preach stuff you don't know about, but I'm sorry. It ain't going to work that good. When you really experience things, it has a lot more meaning to you. Anyway, look what he says. Brethren, verse 13, not count myself to apprehend it. This is one thing I do. Forget those things that are behind me, reaching forth into the things which are before me, and I press... Verse 14, toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God that's in Christ Jesus. Now look what he said in verse 15. Let us therefore, as many as want to be 
mentally and morally developed, that's what the word perfect means, be this minded. In other words, if you want to be developed as a Christian and be mentally and morally developed and be a soldier, put this mind in you. And if anything be otherwise <clears throat> minded, if any of you, God shall reveal it unto him. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Mind the same things. Here he goes again. Put on the mind of Christ. Everybody get the same information in their mind? We'll all have the same judgment. We'll all have the same things. That's what it goes to. Can I hear an amen? amen. Now, <clears throat> verse 17. He says, Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which so <clears throat> walk so as you have us for an example. We need to know the saints of God that pray and the saints of God that believe and the saints of God that stay in the scriptures. And we need to honor them. I believe it's a good thing to learn this kind of ideal. But look in chapter 4. I'm going to close with this so I pray that you get this really well. Here we go again in verse 1 of chapter 4 and it talks about a couple of ladies probably that didn't have the same mind. Verse 2 or chapter 1, if you look at this, it is in verse 2, chapter 4, I mean, in verse 2, this uh, Eodius <coughs> and Senchi, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. In other words, they needed the same scriptures. Evidently, they was lacking somewhere, and they didn't have the same mind. But he was trying to tell them, this is the way to keep your church together. And this is the way to make everything work. Now, for people today that are, are, are not aware, I want you to look carefully with verses 5 and verses 8 all the way through there because I think people need to get a hold of this. Today, you got soldiers. <clears throat> I feel sorry for them that really have been in war zones that are taking mental medication. It tells you in Revelations 18 about pharmacia, drugs through the word of sorcery. That's just one meaning in that verse. It has many more. But look what it says in verse 6. You have to learn as a Christian. Don't worry about things. Once you learn the, the grace of God, you can look at Job and you can find out that the devil couldn't do anything unless God let him. You learn that you keep yourself humble before him and the God of all grace, he shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. So you learn this idea. This is the really cool cool idea. Be careful for nothing. In other words, don't worry. But in everything, he said, by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, make your request be known, known unto God. You tell God about it and <clears throat> the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, Whatsoever th things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if you're going to have any virtue, that's in inward strength, that's inside of you. And if you don't learn this idea, you're not going to have any inward strength. The devil has an agenda to draw all the life of God out of you. So you've got to learn this idea that he talked about up there in verse 6. Cast your cares upon God and wait upon him. Don't let the devil force you out to walk in lust or walk in pride. Oh, I can do this. No, you need to wait on God. And then it'll be good. But you learn if you're going to have any virtue, and that's strength, that's intrinsic. You know, it may not look like it on the surface, but that's the strength that keeps you and makes you not only a believer, but makes you actually a very powerful person in your prayer and everything else. But if you're going to have any virtue or any praise, think on these things. So, you know, we got a little problem today in our country because people don't really talk about this too much anymore. Most guys are preaching today to keep people happy, keep them in church, and keep the money coming in. And there are some of them that don't have all of that agenda, but, you know, there's few. You've got churches today that you'd be surprised to know what they're based on. And it's a real sad thing. But you must learn what we're talking about if you want to have a good report. Think on a good report. Think about good things. Now, there's some bad things that happen, and I'm not going to deny that. How many of y'all know about some bad things that happen? We all do. 
And I know about it, but I ain't going to sit and think on it all the time. Now, some of the things that they don't learn, I have to do this every morning. My prayer life usually starts up here from 3 to 4 o'clock every morning in my life. The past month, I had a couple of days that was a little, a little lacking, but I find out I have an opposition, or I have an opposer, I could say it that way. And he doesn't like for me to pray like that. He'd like for me to think on things that aren't right. But I take Matthew 18 and 18. He said, anything you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. I have to tell him that every morning. Because you know what the Bible said in, what is it, uh, Daniel 7, 25? I don't think that you should actually know them scriptures unless you're one of these guys like we are that stays in it. <clears throat> but it uses a word, it says, and he shall change the laws and the times, and he shall wear out the saints. You know who he's talking about? He's talking about the devil. How many of y'all know about the Patriot Act? Things like this, that where they can arrest you now and hold you from now on, and you don't even get a court or a trial or a judge. And it's worse than that in Canada. I don't want to get into that, but the idea is the word wear out. You want to look at this in your strongs? Daniel 7, 25, he'll wear out the saints. That means mentally. You are not going to have any days in your life where you do not take authority over the devil and bind him and cast him down. I bind him every morning in my life. I bind you, devil, and I cast you out. Get out, Satan. You're a liar, you foul devil. The Bible said in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, this is the most important part of our Bible outside of Jesus Christ is learning your mind. If you find out in Genesis 6, 5, that he, what? He saw the imagination of the heart was continually evil. You see Romans chapter 1, you'll find out in verse 21 that their evil of their imagination, through this they corrupted themselves and they became homosexuals, lesbians, transgenders, transvestites, or whatever they had. In those days, I'm sure it was this bad or worse. And then you look at verse number 28 in Romans 1, it talks about reprobate. They became reprobate because they didn't understand the idea about protecting their mind. Honey, you better protect your mind. You better learn about the devil wearing people out in their mind and just giving in to anything. No, you don't give in to anything. You learn to stand to that devil. And this is what it talks about, a good report here learning to protect your mind, put on the mind of Christ. What if Jesus in Luke 4 or Matthew 4 when he says, oh, you can turn that stone into bread. You've been fasting 40 days. You know you don't feel good. Go ahead and do it. What if he had did that? Jesus said, no, devil. It's written, man, don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You know what will keep you living? is the Word of God. You know what will keep you in victory? Is the Word of God. Not denominationalism, not any of this ecumenical movements where they want to bring everybody into one church like Billy Graham. I shouldn't say that now that they want to lift him up and make him a king of kings. But I, he said it. I've recorded it. They want you to believe to bring all religions together. That's where they're going. That's part of the mark of the beast. Which I could talk on a little bit later if I had another hour. But the thing about it is we as Christians have to stay with our scriptures. We have to guard our mind. We have to be this. The diligent take it by force. Amen? But if you look in all of this stuff, you look in Isaiah 47, verses 8, 10, 12. You find out enchantments. Most Christians today, they don't even know what an enchantment is. They don't know what sorcery is. They don't know what soothsaying is. They don't know what charming is. They don't, don't know what divining is. They don't even know where to find it at in the scriptures. Why? I wonder why. They have other ideas that they want to preach that is much more and much more appreciated Nobody wants to hear about the devil except he's a wise man. Amen? <laughs> I mean, you better learn how to cast him out. If you don't learn how to cast him out, it won't be a happy day for you. Anyway, this is what we're living in. We're living in a world, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He's the God of this world, and everybody likes him. And remember, 
They love lies. People love lies. And the more of the truth you have in your life, the more you're going to stand out, probably. Thank God if you're a Christian and you're standing for truth and you're not really opposed by a lot of people, that's good. I guess, you know, you thank God for peace. Amen? Amen. But you take this stuff in Philippians 4 and you remember that. The whole foundation of being saved lies upon keeping your mind free. If you don't keep your mind free, you'll be Romans 1, 28. You have a reprobate mind because these devils, they're trying our children today. They're trying to tell our children on the way of television, oh, your boys can come a girl. You don't think they're going to do it? They're going to do it. They've already done it in Norway. We've already shown the people in Norway what they've did to the minds of the children there. You've already found it today. They got in Target. They got the bathroom for the transgenders. I don't think people should even go into a store like that. But that's where we're going in this country because the leaders of our country are basically behind everything I've talked about. It's Rupert Murdoch, Fox News. He's the one that has HarperCollins Publishing Company. What does he do? They print the paranormal encyclopedia. How many of y'all know that that is not a good thing? They print the, I mean, they can own these other subsidiaries down below them, and they print these revised versions. And these are the same group, the Hollywood Jews, that own TBN. So, you know, it's just the way it is, and that's the life we're living in. So I just kind of dropped the issue. And remember, stand fast. Stay in your word. Can I hear an amen? amen. Come on, let's all stand. I want to thank you for listening to our program today. I want to thank everyone today that's tuned in by the way of television. We thank you very much. I appreciate everybody. Lift your hand and let's pray together. Father, we thank you right now. Lord, that by your power and by your might, Lord, we love you and we thank you. And we call down the power of heaven, Father. We ask you to fill us. Fill us with the precious Holy Ghost. And Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. I give you praise. I give you honor. And I give you glory. And I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Anybody else want prayer today before we close the service? You all right, Sister Packham? Well, get up here and I'll pray for you. Praise God. Sister Packham, long-time prayer partner. You want prayer this morning, Sharon? God's a good God. I hear you. You know, this, the leg, I, finally David said that me to go to the doctor. Finally I went to the doctor. He didn't even know what's wrong. They don't know what's wrong. The doctors today, they, they want to sell you maintenance. Yeah, right. Okay. They'll sell you, you know, take this pill every week, yeah. every day. If you have a side effect, don't worry. We'll sell you another pill to take care of the side effect. Yeah. And if you have another side effect, we'll sell you another pill to take care of that one. That's true. Yeah. Is that what they told you? About the chemo, side effects, medicines to control it. How many of y'all believe the devil's a liar? Yes, he is. All right. Jesus. Melanie, you and Brother Mark, Brother Mark there, put y'all's hands here. and I want to believe God together. This foul devil. Now, which leg is it, honey, bothering you? Your left leg? This one, but also I've got, look here on my neck. You see that? That's happening all over. You see that? Yeah, put your hand right here, Brother Mark. We're going to pray and we're going to believe God. Point y'all finger this way, saints. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, cleanse this blood for the glory of God. Get out, you foul devil. We curse you from your roots. We pluck you up and plant you into the sea. And Father, I believe you for the power that rose Jesus from the dead. Lord, in Ephesians 1, you gave us power. Lord, when you put us into the body where our Lord Jesus is. Jesus. And Father, we thank you right now that you told us, Lord, to heal the sick. And Father, we're being in obedience to you. And by the name of Jesus, we bind every devil. We bind every demon. And we cast you out, devil, in Jesus' name. And Father, I praise you for it. I want you to put your hand right here on Sharon now. Here, Sister Pack, turn around. You can help us too. Father, we thank you right now. Point your finger this way, church. 
Say it with me. Say, devil, devil. we bind you. We, bind we know who you are. We, who you we are. pluck you up pluck from you the up. roots. Come out in Jesus' name. Come out in Jesus' name. Don't come back anymore, devil. We bind you and cast you out. We command you to take your hands off us. And Father, we are so humbly thankful to you right now. I believe you, God, that you're a wonderful Savior. And Lord, we love you with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and with all of our strength. And Father, we thank you, Lord, and ask you to stay with us, Father. Ordain our footsteps. Help us to be in the grace of God. And Father, I thank you all in the name of Jesus. And I praise you for it. We thank you, Lord. Say it with me. Say, Father, we trust in you. In Jesus' name. You are our healer. We praise you for it. We thank you for it. And the devil is a liar. And you promised to bless our food and water. And we love you, Father. We praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. All right. Something in there, I don't know what it was. <laughs> so anyhow, here's my little check. Yes, ma'am. We'll put it in the Give me my hug. There. One more hug. Okay, God bless you, brother. I appreciate you so much. That's the word. We love you, honey. <sighs> All right, Melanie. Sir. You and brother Mark. Point y'all's finger in this way, church. We ain't done yet. Father, we thank you right now for the double portion. Lord, in hard times, as Elisha was facing, you worked it out, Lord, that he had a double portion. And Father, we thank you right now for that double portion that Sister Pack asked for. And Father, I believe you brought it out of her mouth to give it to your servants today. And by the name of Jesus, Father, we call it forth. And by the name of Jesus, Lord, we believe you for it. And by the name of Jesus, Father, we pray that, Lord, you give it to us too. You're no respect of people. Now, Father, I thank you for the double portion. Say it with me, church. Double portion. Double portion. I thank you, Lord. Thank you. I believe you for it. And I believe you, Father, all in the name of Jesus. <laughs> for what you have asked for. I believe it's there and I believe it's done. And in the name of Jesus, we bind every foul serpent. We cast you out, devil. That's what we think about you. And Father, I thank you now. Fill us with your power and with your might. And this devil, Lord, that's come against us, we bind him in the name of Jesus. Say it with me. Devil. Devil. We bind you and we cast you out. We command you not to come back. In the name of Jesus. God, I praise you for it. And Lord, everybody that believes with us in one mind and one accord, Father, can have their healing today. Lift your hand and say, Father, I receive it. Father, I thank you. Father, I praise you for it. I believe it, Lord. I believe you, Lord, to fill me. Fill me, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Name of Jesus. God, I praise name you for it. Jesus. Praise your holy name. Father, I praise your holy name. And everybody said.